Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. For the next hour, we will be answering those landscape questions. Keep in mind that we aren't accepting phone-in questions for the time being. You can still send us those questions by email and those pictures. The address is byf at unl.edu. Tell us where you live, please. You can also follow us on social media pages, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. And Jody, it's an art project. <laughs> it's a living thing. What is that? Okay, so I probably made a mistake by telling everyone how much I don't like galls because that's all I've been hearing about are galls. So I wanted to do a little bit of a, what is a gall and why is it there? So I brought some live samples, well, not anymore, um, but these are maple bladder gall. A lot of people are seeing these. We're getting a lot of calls. There's these little balls on the leaves and they were red and then they're turning green and people want to know what to do. They do sense that it is some type of insect, but they want to know what to do. I want to tell you that it looks worse than it is. So a lot of these galls, there's not really a lot you can do with it. Um, but I mean, you can pick off the leaves that are affected. So now to my art project, I do not, I did not have clay at my house. So I used what we had and it's putty. <laughs> So what you're looking at, this is my art, is a leaf. A leaf. And what happens, a gall basically is, you know, when, when we get bitten or we have some reaction to a stimulus, you know, we may get a rash as a human. We may itch, we may have histamines, you know, whatever. For a leaf, they have some type of reaction to an organism that's feeding there. So let's just say an insect comes and feeds or lays an egg. The the leaf or the plant, the developing tissue can surround it and create this gall. And so sometimes they turn out to be like these ball looking things. Sometimes they end up looking spindly like these spindle galls or fingers. They may change colors. They may look like furry things. They may look like bullet galls. And often we name them that way because of what they look like and the plant they're on. So this is oak bullet gall. This is maple bladder gall. And so that's what a gall is. There are some that may stunt the plant or tree, but again, it's only gonna be that developing growing tissue. So if you can prune them off, you can, but it looks worse than it really is. Okay, thanks, Jody. <laughs> okay, Bill. Mine is not as artistic. <laughs> no, um, definitely. <laughs> so I wanna hit a couple different points uh, here today. Um, I have just some grass because I like grass. And uh, one of the things that I'm noticing is uh, through my nose is that the grasses are making seed heads, right? And at the grass out, you're starting to pick up with the pines too. Uh, and the trees, there are pounds everywhere. Um, but the nice thing that this is telling us about what our lawn is doing is that it's spending a lot of energy to try to make seeds. And so this is just tall fescue right now. It's growing like crazy. So a couple things. One, it helps us identify the grass. So when we get those pictures in and we're looking for features to identify what it is, seed heads are gold. So they can really help us you know, complete the picture. Another thing to think about now is, is fertility. If your lawn is looking a little bit, you know, not super lush right now, that's probably an indication that it's uh, maybe a little bit hungry because we've gotten a lot of water, especially uh, through much of this state uh, recently. And so um, when it's spending energy, that, that's a good sign to say, hey, we might need to put some fertilizer if we're not getting a lot of mowing. Uh, and then when we are mowing, making sure that we are, um, uh, you know, returning those clippings as best as possible, but sometimes we can't because you maybe you got behind with the, the swamp and you couldn't mow. So that would be the one occasion, maybe I'd say it's okay to bag, but I hate bagging, I never use one. So try to avoid doing that. And then another good, good thing about identifying these grasses are this is tall fescue. This is our sedge friend, um, yellow nut sedge. It's starting to really bolt out of the ground now. If you have a history of net sedge problems and you roll them through your fingers and feel that triangular stem, that's when you go out with a product is now. The earlier, the better. So if you have that history, don't wait till June when it's bad. Get after it now. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. Yep. Jeff, you're going to be in charge of Plant of the Week every single time you come on air based on your beauty. You know, I can't take credit for this. I mean, we had an art project. We had the angry <laughs> turf guy. Uh, <laughs> and now, you know, so between my wife and our neighbor, Ann, they knew I was getting ready for the show. So they went out and I came downstairs and they had this waiting for me, so. Perfect. So which is nice, and, and really, so we have some things here. We have peonies, we have iris, 
Uh, I have a Metaru, I have an Airwood by Burnham just getting ready to get started, then uh, the purple hazelnut in the back here. And part of this for me is just kind of talking about what's going on. I mean, we've had kind of a crazy spring, which is typical for Nebraska, right? And so things like the iris and uh, the peony, I know on campus, they're done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and here we are just starting in the last couple of days in South Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So there's just little pockets where the temperatures maybe didn't fluctuate quite as much. Things were on schedule in areas where things fluctuated more. Then we had some, some other things happen and now things are a little slow. I was wondering if the peonies were ever gonna bloom. Right. And uh, so here in the last couple of days, they've started blooming, so. Beautiful. And the, you know, the viburnums are coming on, seems a little late. I think a couple of years ago, the viburnums and lilacs and everything bloomed on the same week in the last week of April or something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just kind of one of those years. Yeah, beautiful. All right, thanks. Okay, picture time. Jody, you have three in a row here, and there could have been about 10. <laughs> of the same thing. <clears throat> and they're from mostly eastern Nebraska. What is this that's on the linden? Hundreds of them on the four-year-old tree. Uh, this second one is a Bellevue viewer with another one. And the third one is what are the little red horns on my linden tree? What are those things on the linden? They're galls. <laughs> <laughs> so when I said they could be caused by an organism, it could be an insect, it could be a mite. Um, the insect could be a midge, which is a small little fly. It could be a small little wasp. It could be an aphid. All these things can somehow have the plant to do this. But this is linden finger gall, and that's what happens. If you want to treat for it, I wouldn't recommend it because by the time you see this, it's too late to treat. So, mm -hmm. you know, the treating would be when the female is laying the eggs and we don't really know when that is. Mm -hmm. So it's not always going to be the same. If there is an over, if, if the insect overwinters on the plant, you may be able to do a dormant oil um, before bud break, but that's also has really to do with timing. So. All right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you have a f another one. <laughs> this is a different plant, and this is on a farm near Mondamon, Iowa. Found these pink bumps on a wild plum. They know it's an insect. They wonder what kind. What do you guys think? It's a gall. <laughs> <laughs> Golly. It's a plum, finger gall, probably. <laughs> yes, it's a gall. So not really anything to worry about. It's going to look worse than it really is. And especially in a wild plum thicket. Yes. And it fluctuates from year to year, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, I think like if they're gonna emerge, they might come back to that same plant and be close by. But mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of plants don't get them. Just mm -hmm. seems like mm -hmm. everybody watches our show. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, thanks. <laughs> All right, um, your, your, your most favorite subject, weeds. Yeah, yeah. They're out there right now. Uh -huh. yeah. So your first one here, uh, it's not in a lawn, but we see it a lot in lawn. And this is actually a north exposure, this first couple of pictures. Mm -hmm. This is in Norfolk. She wants to know what it is and how does she get rid of it? No, it's just chickweed. So if it's, if it's in a situation like that, you can use any kind of non-selective product and, and kill it off that way. If this would be in your lawn, you know, most of our um, uh, selective products will have no problem taking that one out. So uh, it's a pretty common one and pretty easy one to take care of too. Annual, perennial? Yes. Yes. <laughs> one or the other? Because <laughs> I think there's more than one. Yeah, I think it depends. <laughs> I think because like mouse hair, uh, this, was, this is common, but there's going to be some differences on that. Um, okay. You just like to put me on a spot. <laughs> no, I just like to ask the questions because yeah. I can never remember. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you have a couple of others. This is also a Norfolk viewer. Um, she wonders what it is and how she gets rid of it. It showed up years ago and it just, she's pulled it, she's sprayed it with something that is an undefined weed killer, mm -hmm. sprouts around other plants, and it's related to one of our most favorite yes. lawn weeds. This is yeah, an oxalis, um, another, uh, this is cool. It's, it came and telling me it's ornamental because I saw it first as purple and went, wow, that's, that's interesting. I'm only thinking about the green one that I'd see in the lawn. Uh, so the control would be very similar again. Most of our um, three-way type mixes are gonna uh, take care of this guy too. Um, but I think it's just really neat to have all the anthocyanin production that gives it that really purple color. And uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just interesting to, uh, to see that. So it's the first time I've ever seen an ornamental oxalis like that. So how, does, how do we control the oxalis? That's, I mean, 
Yeah, it's those are, again uh, the broadleaf weeds. We generally want to treat later, but coming out, we're here now. And so products that have multiple active ingredients, um, things like sulfentrazone or carfentrazone in with 2,4-D or dicamber, some of those other types of products in combination are gonna give us much better control of those types of weeds in the springtime when they're really difficult to control. The, con the weather is just so favorable for these weeds to grow. And so it's really hard to kill them. It's easier in the fall when they're getting ready for winter. Okay, sulfentrazone and? Uh, carfentrazone. Carfentrazone, mm -hmm. so, all right, excellent, yep. thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, pruning time or not, okay. Jeff, you have a, a handful here. The first one is a viewer planted um, a mugo pine and didn't expect it to <laughs> get this big. Yeah. And uh, they're wondering what they can do. It's in Elkhorn, it's now over nine feet tall. Too, too many chocolate shakes at the Dirty Suite. <laughs> Apparently. So, um, yeah, this is something that uh, a mugo, so they can, there are a very dwarf growing mugos, um, but they do, um, many of them do want to reach uh, larger sizes. So this is something you would have to be on every spring, mm -hmm. um, can, cutting the candles back to keep its size in check. And so we're kind of past that point. You can go ahead and, and do some of that to the candling if you want to keep the plant. Um, if you remove a branch, you know, we're not going to get anything to really fill in over time. So you could do some selective pruning uh, for shape if you'd like. Um, to, to make it a little smaller, maybe getting it off some of the other plants and creating some space. But, you know, you're not going to cut it way back and expect it to, it's not a forsythia, it's not going to come back and you'll be able to can it out or anything. So, unfortunately. All right. Uh, so, your next one here is there's a variety of blue spruce called totem. We've had mm -hmm. several questions about this. And he's saying this one is about seven years old. This is a papillion viewer, thrived, and then it begin to progressively lose the bottom. Right. He did say it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of water coming from the downspout. It's a construction soil location. It appears as though it's still putting on decent growth, but any mm -hmm. suggestions on this one? You know, I would, I, my, my gut tells me that it probably is a needle cast, rhizophyrin needle cast, mm -hmm. kind of working its way up. And, um, you know, it's next to the deck. I'm sure having uh, a little bit reduced airflow meant that those that disease got started on there, and um, and now that it's opened up, it probably will decrease now that there's more airflow. So, you know, I would say that either you plant something around the base to uh, hide the base, or start over with something else. So. All right, <laughs> thanks, Jeff. And your final one here. Uh, we don't know where she is, but. This is a dwarf Alberta spruce yeah. that has a different looking branch growing out of it. Uh, so I, th and I think we had a second picture maybe on that one too, showing the branch. Yeah, and that's, this is actually kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were looking at a, a witch's broom and a pine earlier today uh, on campus. And so, you know, all our dwarf conifers or most of them come from some sort of unusual growth on a normal sized conifer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we get our dwarfs and they, you know, master propagators figure out a way to graft and, and create these dwarf um, uh, evergreens that we can have. So for something like this, what you would wanna do is go in as best you can and remove that growth now. So that's mm -hmm. something, you got it early. Uh, a lot of times you'll see this and it's already <laughs> grown six feet right. and taking over the plant and cause some damage. I think you could probably go in uh, deep into the plant and cut that off where it connects to the to another branch or to the main trunk and that will help uh, and then maybe over time it'll kind of fill in but that that's what I would suggest now otherwise you've got the big boy yeah right yeah exactly yeah, coming out the side exactly <laughs> right <laughs> okay you know we want to share our love of gardening to everybody and even though you may not have space to put in an actual garden you can always try your hand with containers we're going to show you a series of features on containers, but to start, here's Terry James to talk about the container itself. Containers are becoming more and more popular than ever before. They are very versatile. Uh, you can use them in multiple different locations, occasions. You can have them on your balcony in an urban landscape, or you can have them out in a public garden to add some multiple dimensional interest. There are a couple things that you really need to make sure that you do when you're thinking about using containers, no matter whether they're small or large. First, you need to decide what you want to use as a container. 
They can be pretty much anything. You can use old, uh, old chimney pipes, you can use plastic, you can use old wheelbarrows or watering cans. All you need to do is make sure that you have a few things in common. You need to make sure that it has drainage. If it does not have drainage, you need to make, you need to add the drainage to it. If the bottom does not have a lip like this one does, then you need to make sure that the drainage is actually along the outside edge of the container instead of the bottom. The other thing is, is the large containers, you really don't want to fill them up with soil. Soil's pretty expensive. So to kind of lessen that expense, you might want to fill the bottom third up with some kind of filler. You can use old water bottles. You can use the old containers that your plants came in. Or one of the best things that I really like to use is mulch. Fill up the bottom third with wood mulch, and then in the end of the season, you can actually take that and just put that back into your compost. The one thing you want to stay away from is using rock. Rock is heavy and it actually kind of creates this multi-layer and water doesn't actually seep through until the soil is completely saturated. So sometimes you'll have some water issues if you use rock in the bottom of your container. The next thing you want to look at is the soil. Use a soilless mix and something that has a little bit more mulch in it. The mulch and the wood bark will actually help hold that moisture in that soil throughout the summer. You also want to make sure it has some peat, some perlite, and some vermiculite in it. One of the things that you really don't want to skimp on is the soil. That's where all of the plants are going to get all their nutrients. They're going to live there and you really want to give them the best house to live in. So make sure that you get good soil. When you do start to fill up this container, make sure that you give the lip a little bit of edge. So you want to fill the container and give it about one inch between the lip of the container and the soil line. You also want to pre-moisten the soil before you put it in the container and you want to add a slow release fertilizer, one that has at least a three month life, six month if you can find it. Also, you want to make sure if you want, if you're planting any kind of vegetables in here, the slow release needs to be for vegetables. There are a few that uh, might have some micronutrients in it that you don't want the vegetables to, uh, to take up. Go get that great soil and start planting containers in your backyard. And next time we'll hear more from Terry about what to actually plant in those containers. She loves containers. She's very good at it. <laughs> All right, insects, your next one. Um, this is located in Papillion. They found this insect a couple of months ago, Jody, and they wonder what it is. Hey, this is a wheel bug. And yeah, they come out late summer, fall, they're predators, assassin bug family, cool. <laughs> they actually do eat Japanese beetles, so they're super cool. Excellent, oh, wow. excellent. Your second ID is uh, eggs on a birch leaf, and she did see a few tiny green guys crawling near the eggs. She wonders who, who she's hosting. This Ooh. is in Omaha. Okay, well then these may be um, lady beetle uh, eggs. They usually will lay their eggs close to where there's something good to eat. So if they're little aphids, then they're lunch, dinner. Excellent. And then we had a handful of uh, all sorts of things going on in the Hope Garden. Okay. We had, and we have had a couple of questions from people about uh, little guys like this on cabbage yeah. or holes in cabbage yeah, leaves. Yeah, so uh, a couple of weeks ago they were pretty tiny. And so uh, that's pretty tiny. That's uh, the... Uh, diamondback moth, uh, caterpillar. If you look really closely, they've got like a little forked behind. Um, but I mean, th at this point, it's not really too bad. You can hand pick them, you can spray them off, or you can use BT if you want, but it's when they're in combination with like the imported cabbage worm and cutworms and other things, so. All right. And then we had, uh, we also had a couple of viewers send us pictures of this and you found this one too. Yeah, uh, so this is the rose slug sawfly, and they're doing this window painting. So you may see them on like the smaller leaves, but then when they get bigger, they start really chewing into the leaves. If you flip them over, you may be able to see them. They look like a caterpillar, but they're actually the larva of, uh, of, a, of a stingless wasp. 
um, and then they will come back to that same plant year after year. So if you can pick those off or spray them with a strong hose of water, um, that would probably be the best. If you want to treat with something, probably spinosad would be probably the best thing. And is it a drench, cover both sides, or what works the um, best? Yeah, you want to just cover the underside is underside where they're for sure. feeding. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Bill, your first turf question on this one comes Sounds from good. Alma. Okay. Areas in the bluegrass lawn that don't apparently have very many blades. The sod seems thick, but it doesn't send up a lot of that blade tissue. Okay. Dug some up. He said it's trying to send a lot of runners from the original plant. So he wonders, does this have anything to do with thin blade or what's going on with yeah, this? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that we can do to, to drive density. Um, and it's complicated, like a lot of things. Um, if we are under fertilizing or over, over fertilizing, then we get a thinning of the canopy. Um, if we're scalping when we're mowing, or even just maybe not even scalping where you see it, but you maybe you should be mowing a little bit more frequently, that starts to thin the canopy out too. So, um, you know, one of the homeowners asked, you know, what do I, the golf course do or the athletic field do to make the grass look so thick? They just mow frequently, and they mow maybe at two and a half, two inches or, or less. And so um, those are things you want to do is really assess how are you mowing and then go from there and look at your fertility. And again, we talked about this last time I was on, you know, if you need to mow more or less than once a week, you're either you have too much fertilizer or too little fertilizer. So your goal should be fertilized to be about one mowing a week at three inches. Uh, if you do that, you're gonna get the best density. All right, Excuse me. <clears throat> excellent. So your next series is um, several spots that look like the grass is shorter. He sent three pictures, so we kind of get a notion of what this is mm -hmm. going on. Uh, the grass is shorter than everything around it. It almost looks like it stopped growing. He's used a pre-merge as well as Ornamec, which we think is also an old pre-merge. Yeah, this is a, a one where we're seeing a lot. Um, the, the second picture of the three had the, like a playground in the background. To me, it really looks a lot like um, potentially some kind of a compaction issue. Um, you'd see that you can't fertilize out of compaction. If you have compacted soils and you put fertilizer down, you don't really see a response. And so that could be part of it. Um, it also could be an application error. So if you're thinking back when you put the pre down, did you accidentally go too high of a rate there? Because it, it could do some root pruning, which is gonna have similar effects to compaction. Uh, in those situations, you have to let, let's let the, the pre kind of break down and let that grass recover. So you'd need some extra babying there. So I would just kind of check me with the screwdriver. See, is it really hard? If it is, then maybe thinking about um, uh, you know, aerating it. Otherwise, if it is from a pre, um, you kind of just have to, you could aerate, that could help um, to kind of break the pre up, but you kind of have to wait for the microbes to eat it so the roots can recover naturally. All right, and then your final one is uh, a viewer who followed our directions on POA annua. Yeah. And uh, he started mowing at a higher height. Now the areas are turning tannish, yellowish, oranges. Hasn't been overwatered until this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Did put on a fertilizer and he's wondering if he should fertilize again. Yeah, so this is um, one of those scenarios uh, that I was talking about with my sample. So the grass just put all the seed out. It's a winter annual and it wants to now die. And let's let it die. So if you have bluegrass around it or you have a bluegrass tall fescue blend, as that poa will die out, the other grass species will come in. And then you can always interseed uh, with some tall fescue, if it's a pure tall fescue lawn, you don't have much you know, runners to fill in those voids, but you're along your way. So let's let nature take its course. You've changed the ecology, and so now uh, the, the, the desirable species will have the advantage. All right, excellent, thanks, Bill. Okay, you're, you have crab apples and pears and all sorts of things coming up, Jeff. Your okay. first one here is a viewer who says, uh, only half of this tree is flowering. Mm. She has sprayed in the past for rust, and ev she thinks ever since that time, it, the majority of the tree doesn't bloom. Is she correct on that, or what's going on? I don't know. I mean, I don't know why a rust application or a fungicide would, would, would call that, uh, cause that. So, you know, whether... Um, the tree is reverting back to an original crab apple or something like that. And you know what I would say for crab apples, any crab apple that has been purchased in the last 25 years probably is pretty resistant to most rust. So mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't worry about that. But yeah, I guess if it's not doing what, it, what you want it to do, maybe it's time to look for a different right. crab apple. Yeah, when they bloom half one color, half yeah. the other, it's yeah. probably not what she bought. Right. Exactly. 
And then you have uh, another one here that is, uh, this image was taken in York. This is, this is one where he's wondering, um, he calls these runners, they started appearing at the base, it's a pair. Mm -hmm. um, they come in stronger as he prunes and the tree is healthy. He doesn't want to damage the health of the tree, but how does he manage the suckers on this it's one? It's tough, and you know, pruning them back is all you can do. You know, take them as close as you can, but it's the rootstock of that grafted pear is continuing mm -hmm. to try to do its thing. So, you know, that's the frustration with a lot of grafted plants is that, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you'll have this problem with suckering. All right, and so then you have one from Neely, Nebraska, which is a crab apple. Mm -hmm. Doing the same thing. Uh, any other thoughts on this one? This is actually, um, it started doing this over the last three to four years. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. And it, it kind of appears that this tree is planted too deep, uh, which would encourage some of that uh, suckering that you're seeing. So um, I would be tempted to go in and see if we can excavate a little bit around that tree um, and see if we can pull some of the soil back and see if we can find a root flutter, depending on how deep you're having to go. If it's a few inches, I think I'd go for it. If it seems like you have to go farther than that, then maybe you just take New it tree. as a, yeah. Just. New tree. All right, and you have a, a final one here that is a viewer who bought a 10-year-old home in Elkhorn. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this is the crab apple root on one of them. Oh, right, so that's a stem girdling root. Mm -hmm. This is something you want to keep an eye on. It's you know, at this point, I don't know if I would do any surgery on that tree. You may shorten its life even shorter than it's going to be at this point. I would keep an eye on the tree and make sure if you start seeing movement, ground soil movement around the tree and on a windy day, then <laughs> that may be something that you want to think about having the tree, you know, something new put in there. Right. At least it's a crab apple. So yeah. Movement like this is probably not going to fall off. Right, yeah, hopefully, if it's not too big of a crab. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, we had plans to plant this past weekend. We could not get going due to what would be a lot of rainy weather here in Lincoln. Let's take a minute to hear from Terry James at the Backyard Farmer Garden about what is growing and flowering now. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, Mother Nature threw another curveball again. It has rained a lot here in Lincoln. Uh, nothing really able to be able to put into the ground. So all of our plants again are sitting, hardening off, getting ready to go. Hopefully looking at the forecast, this next week we'll be able to get everything in the ground. So one fair swoop, we'll get it all in. However, you can stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out what's blooming in the upper part of the garden. We have some iris, um, our Shelly Penstemon are blooming. Our mock orange is looking beautiful, that pure white kind of sticking out in the garden. Our roses are starting to bloom. We do have quite a few weeds uh, that have popped up because of the rain, but those can come out real easy because the ground is so soft. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now, of course, it is time for the lightning round. Are you ready, Jeff? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, this is an Ida Grove, Iowa viewer. Wants to know how to get rid of stinging nettles in her raspberry patch. Uh, I think you're gonna have to pull them. <laughs> so, you know, it's early yet. They're, I mean, they're still making soup out of them or something, right? So yeah, sort of tea or something they do with nettles, right? So okay. just get out there with your good gloves and just go pull. for it. Yeah. All right. This is a Southeast South Dakota viewer whose uh, rhubarb stalks are not very thrifty this year. How do you increase production in rhubarb? Well, I guess I'd want to know how old they are. That would be one of the thing. If it's a really old plant, maybe it's time to divide the plant. So sometimes that'll help kind of restart the clock on those. All right. um, and I'd want to make sure you know, they're not sitting in too wet a soil. All right, how do you get rid of Virginia creeper? Um, you know, that might be a, a turf question. You might have to lean on some herbicides to do that. But I think I'd cut it back, cut it back hard, mow it off, and then look at spraying it. All right, should you prune green peppers? And if so, how? If you, should you prune green peppers? Well, you can probably pinch off some of them if you're worried about that. If they're flowering too early and you want the plastic to get a little bit bigger, I would just pinch off those flowers. Nice, excellent. You ready? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> this person is saying their grass grew two inches overnight. 
should we expect this to continue with the weather pattern in eastern Nebraska? <laughs> I mean, it'd be exactly two inches, but you know, it's growing quickly. Uh, moisture is what drives growth rate. So when we have this much rain, the water helps those leaves expand. And so that happens and it's gonna slow down. June is generally our slowest growing month in the entire summer. All right, uh, we have a viewer who wonders, is it too late to power rake to get rid of thatch? Uh, no, if you really have a thatch problem, so you really go down and measure it. Um, actually, I like to do it when the grass is actively growing like it is right now. And so you could do it now. I don't like doing it in March when the grass isn't growing and it's weak out of winter. So if you really have the problem, you could do it. All right, this is a viewer out in one of the sand pits out by Overton, wants to know how to control cactus. Pass. I have no idea. We don't have a lot of cactus in Wisconsin. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have also a viewer who wants to know how to get rid of clover in the lawn. Uh, clover in the lawn, that's a challenge right now. You, you can control it with some of the, the new four-way mix herbicides, but generally with a lot of the herbicides would be um, in the spring or in the fall. But actually a lot of the homeowner fertile, uh, herbicides now are containing some of these newer active ingredients that are generally less risky and more effective on these weeds. So there's more options for homeowners than they've had you know, maybe even 10 years ago. They're figuring out that homeowners actually rule the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Jody, you yep. ready? Mm -hmm. uh, several calls this week with garden flocks is yellowing and has all sorts of little oh. red bugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got the flox bug, terrible. Uh, they ruined a lot of flocks last year and they are, they, they've already looked really bad. Oh wait, lightning round, yes. <laughs> Flox bug. <laughs> and how do we control that light? <laughs> that? Uh, um, you might need to use an insecticide for that. I would try some of the horticultural oils first, uh, insecticidal soap. All right. Uh, we have a, you get this question even though it's not an insect. Um, slug control. How do you control slugs and will the plants survive being eaten by slugs? Uh, I don't really know a whole lot about slugs. I usually have to look that up for people when they call. Uh, that sounds like a pass. <laughs> pass. <laughs> All right. Um, there is a spray that is called mosquito yard spray. Is that effective? I'd have to see what the active ingredient is. And so I don't know because it has to do with what's in it and when it's applied and what it's applied for. If it's for an adult mosquito, these are all too hard. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have you got, you're just gonna have to blame our wonderful audience for hard I, questions. <laughs> I love it. And by the way, I knew the cactus question was gonna be a head stumper. Well, yeah, I don't control. I haven't controlled a lot of cactus. Well, do you, what do you do I for do. a cactus? You know, I would if it's near yeah. a lake, I'd use uh, an aquatic herbicide like a Roundup a round so, yeah. or where right. on something like that. Right. Okay. All right. Plants of the week, Jeff. What do we have? Well, we have some Baptisia, so our long stalks here. So this is solar flare. Um, so you can see here it comes in purple and yellow. Um, and there are selections of uh, and hybrids of our native uh, Baptisia. So it's very long lived, deep rooted, super tough plant Baptisia are. And, um, and if you're lucky, we have some places on campus where it's kind of naturalizing. So if you really like them, you know, you can end up with a whole bunch of them at some point. Mm -hmm. So. And then our small little white flower is actually a shrub. So this is mock orange. And so it's very fragrant, fragrant tough, um, very long lived. Uh, there's a lot of um, dwarf cultivars. So there's some newer cultivars out there. And a super interesting story about mock orange, Kim. One of my first jobs was going to a homeowner's house and they had giant mock oranges that were like 15 feet tall. They wanted pruned, you know, and we had to get up on ladders and climb around in these shrubs to try to get them down to, uh, so they could see out their front windows. So. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Anyway. Yeah, so a we long have time some beautiful ago. ones on campus yeah. that are blooming right now. So, and fragrant if, yeah. our, if our viewers could smell what's going on here, which of course they can't. You'll just, you'll just have to take our word for it. All right, insects, Jody. Um, two that are from different viewers. The first is from Springfield. She says hundreds, if not more, in the cow lot, the size of your index finger. And then your second one here is Bertrand, and he's had a white grub problem, treats every summer around Father's Day. So are these the same creature or something different? Uh, I think there's something different. Mm -hmm. But the, the one in the, the first one, it, they may be 
I don't know if they're bees or not, but it looks like a different type of soil. Mm -hmm. So, you know, drier, looser. Um, but if there's hundreds, I, I don't know, it's gotta be bees or bees or wasps, but solitary. Um, this looks like a pretty bad grub problem. What it is, if you zoom in on them, they are like a bunch of beetles totally chopped up into pieces. So it looks like you, there's a grub problem and then there's either a skunk or like a starling or bird like munching on those. So I would recommend uh, maybe a curative treatment for that area um, instead of doing a preventative treatment around Father's Day, do something um, in like August, September. Dilox or something. Dilox, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would recommend. All right. So then your next ones are great pictures of the grubs themselves. Oh, forgot oh, this yeah. one. So this looks like, um, because of its front legs yeah. and its digging legs, it looks like um, a cicada nymph. So they spend most of their life underground. And you kind of mm -hmm. just maybe dug this one up a little early. Mm -hmm. So that's what that is. And then your next ones are um, grubs. And this is an Omaha viewer. He wonders what they become. They look like the little grubs, but they're huge. A second picture, I think, yeah. is. And that one, that yeah. one shows that, like the size, and that they move around their backs. And so that's the green June beetle. Um, they they turn into really big beetles that sound like bumblebees, and they're usually not too much of a problem. So I, I wouldn't really do a treatment for for that if you've only got that many. They don't really destroy the turf. Okay, he, had, he did say they use milky spore and some of those kinds of things. Yeah, and so, that would probably yeah. help for those grubs. And they'll swarm the green June beetles because we yeah, had them swarming on East campus. campus and it's really cool when they do yeah, that. Yeah, it's really so loud. Yeah, um, yeah there's a couple of places um, on, on the campus and they, they may, they're they known for eating fruit, but they can't chew into the fruit. So a different beetle has to chew in first. So the Japanese beetle chews, chews first and oh. then you'll see them together. Then they can go. Cool. All right. So you have uh, two pictures from two different viewers. They want to identify this thing. One wants to keep it. The other wants to kill it. What yeah. is it? <laughs> this is a, a horsetail. Uh, this is something that uh, I've had some experience with too, trying to uh, to remove. Um, it it kind of likes, uh, you know, infertile soils, uh, not a lot of competition. Uh, areas aren't really disturbed too much. And so you'll see it like in native areas or uh, uh, like grass here is on a kind of poor degraded soils. Um, and so it just kind of, it kind of pops up there. It's kind of an interesting uh, weed. Um, I think carfentrazone uh, is a herbicide for the person that wants to kill it selectively. Um, that's an option that would be there usually in combination with the standard types of post-emergence herbicides. Um, that is something that we see come up in the spring and, and kind of lingers through the summer, so. All right, and then your next one is one we've talked about before. He's, he really just wants to know what it is, not necessarily how to control it. Yeah, this is a uh, mock strawberry, um, and so mm -hmm. it's just one of those, especially if it's a shady area, this might have a better advantage to handle that than maybe the grass does, and maybe it's the, the most appropriate grass species in that spot. Excellent. Or plant species. All right, uh, Jeff, you have about five different issues associated with um, what they think is herbicide damage, okay. starting with potatoes and it's the Kennebex on the edge that are the worst. Yeah, you know, and after looking at that, and so this person talked about they'd uh, tilled in uh, straw manure and that maybe there might have been issues with the nearby herbicide treatment. It's kind of hard to tell. That could be weather related, certainly. I think that that's right. an option. My temptation would be is to dig up one of the tubers and just see what's going on. Okay. And just see if we have some rot going on or something else, because potatoes have a lot of potential funguses. So right. I would be curious. Okay, and so I think you have two, three, four more that are tomatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, the first, they thought this was frost damage. This is a Hardington viewer. You think, yes, frost? It looks like it could be weather. You know, anything like that I would clean up. So we talked about pruning peppers. I would prune the dead and the, the diseased off of that and see if it grows out of it. It's still really early in the season, so. Okay, and then you have another tomato that is clearly shoestringed. Yeah, that really looks like some sort of uh, growth regulator herbicide, so to me. Right. I, I know they were thinking frost, but yeah. boy. Yeah. So whether the cover may have had some herbicide on it, some res residual yeah. stuff might be, that's what I'm kind of wondering. All right, and then I think you have one that is, uh, this it's is a, a Nick, Nick, yeah, tree peony that looks like this. And that's another interesting one. That's one I'd want to look at the, where that uh, part of the plant connects to the other. 
uh, and see if there's insect damage or something else going on there for there to be such distinct differences between that. So it may just be pruning that off, quite honestly. All right, since we have some tree peonies on campus, I figured you could answer yeah, that one. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, we get quite a number of, is this a weed pictures from week to week. Sometimes it's really difficult to distinguish a weed from something you've actually planted. So here's Matt Soshik to help us take a closer look at weeds that can go from your garden into your turf. Oh, here we are at the Backyard Farmer Garden, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the different weeds that we can get into our landscapes and then eventually into our turf. Um, there's a lot of different types of weeds, and each of them look somewhat similar to some of the landscape plants we have in our landscape, uh, and they can also become a nuisance that's going to spread into our lawn. So what I have here is a, a nice huge dandelion that was growing on the edge of the landscape garden. And you, you know, if you have this in your landscape and you don't take care of it, this nice seed head is going to spread it into your lawn, especially if you have thinned areas, and become a problem. Uh, and just knowing the differences between them, you're looking at leaf texture, uh, and it goes for any weed that you have or any landscape plant. In order to know, you have to be able to identify you know, how it grows, what the characteristics of it are, because uh, a lot of plants will look very similar at a young age or at an older age. So here we have some prickly lettuce. And this one too, I mean, it can look kind of like a dandelion, but it's also a weed. And if that one seeds out in the landscape or in your garden, it's gonna become a really big issue because it, it's a prolific seed producer and it can spread throughout the whole landscape and become a big problem next year, especially when you can't spray herbicides along some of these areas that are more sensitive because uh, it's gonna be detrimental to the plants that you want. Uh, so here we have curly dock. You can see that it's you know a big broad leaf uh, it does produce seed heads, and this one can also be, you know, a small plant, or it can grow to four or five foot tall and really take over a landscape and spread really quickly for, for years to come. Uh, another weed that we can commonly mistake for another is uh, maybe poison ivy. There's a bunch of weeds that do look like poison ivy. Uh, one here I have is wild raspberry, and you can see that it, it might have that, you know, that leaf texture of look like it. If you flip them over, they're white on the bottom, and they also have spines on them, and they, they grow a lot like uh, some of the weeds that we, we think we don't want, like poison ivy. Uh, same here, we have you know wild strawberry. It looks a lot like maybe some of those weeds that we don't want, and you just gotta be able to identify you know, these, these leaves that have lobes on them. Uh, so basically determining how the leaves are set up and the characteristics of the leaf, whether it's lobed, it's hairy, um, the venation on it, if it's a trifoliate or if it's one leaf. Uh, so there's going to be a bunch of different types that, you know, sometimes we can't even identify just by looking at a picture. We're going to need you to, you know, really get detailed images or we might even need a sample to actually compare it to some of these because a lot of the landscape plants do look like weeds and if we can't get a good image, uh, it's tough for us to tell what kind of weed that is. Here we have pokeweed and you can see that it's basically an oval, oval leaf structure. And it can look a lot like some of the other weeds like broadleaf plantain or common plantain, which has a narrower leaf, and then uh, cut plant. So the difference is here is you gotta look at, you know, this one obviously has a lot of uh, lobes on the ends of the leaves, whereas broadleaf plantain is pretty smooth around the edges, and there might be a couple of those lobes at the bottom. And then whereas common plantain is more of a long and slender and it doesn't have those uh, lobes on the end. So when identifying some of these weeds you got to make sure that you look at all the different characteristics. If you can get really good pictures close up when they're little, when they're big, and some of them you can't even tell unless they're flowering. So it's important to get some of those maybe time-lapse pictures, let's say week to week, so we can actually find out what's going on just not taking a split second shot and trying to figure out what it is. So we'd appreciate if you could get some of those, if they are difficult to identify, uh, a little bit more imaging, maybe not just one day, but a week, two weeks, so we can see a little bit more of its growth habits. Uh, and with that, good luck out there, and hopefully you can be able to identify some of these weeds a little better.
And sometimes those weeds fool even us as we try to figure out what it is and how to help you get rid of it if you want to. So make sure you send us good pictures. All right, Jody. Um, so galls, since you love them so much, this is a baroque that has these. Do we know what kind of gall this is and what to do about yeah, it? This is like the noxious oak gall. It's from a tiny wasp. Not really anything you can do unless you want to prune those out. All right, and then our very first one of this one, which is a 15 oak species on the farm, but it's really only one swamp white has this one. What is this? He sent us a couple pictures on this one. Yeah, and this is oak apple gall. Mm -hmm. And there's not anything you really can do about that either. <laughs> <laughs> Other than say, gosh, they're not edible, right? <laughs> All right, Bill uh, Norfolk is sending us a lot of questions this week. All right. This is a viewer who uh, wonders what sort of un unwanted weedy grass this is, and more importantly, is it too late to control it? This came up more abundantly than the tall fescue they planted. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it could be maybe like a broom grass. Um, hard to say with this, without really examining the leaves. Um, if it is, generally just mowing it normally, it, will, it cannot compete the other grasses. Um, if you need to try to control it, pulling it out to clump type grass or non-selective herbicides are probably your best option. All right, so then you have, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple other ones here. Uh, this one came in with the Kentucky bluegrass lawn. He thinks this is tall fescue, but he's also wondering, does he have foxtail or crabgrass? It could be tall fescue. It's definitely not foxtail or crabgrass. Those are our summer annuals, and they wouldn't be at this leaf stage at this time. So it has some of the characteristics of tall fescue from those pictures. And it just the tall fescues look stemmy right now because they're making seed, and that's why they have that different appearance. All right, so no way to selectively take tall fescue out of bluegrass. No, it's just going to be a roundup or just live with it and mow it, and, and you won't even notice it after the seed head push. All right, excellent. All right, so we have some tree questions, and um, these are aspens to begin with. The first here, uh, this is Lincoln, 18 years old, black hard crusted areas, and then no drainage in the Y. The, he stuck a screwdriver in there mm -hmm. so you can see what's going on on this one. Right. Um, what do That's we do? It's a canker, you know, the quaking aspens, there's several cankers that they're susceptible to. I would just keep an eye on it, but it'll slowly weaken that, that stem. So. Okay, excellent. And then your next one is a Sutherland viewer. And uh, she's got uh, two of them, 25 years old. Yeah. And this one has kind of that thin center piece and then this blackened sort of thing around it. She wonders. Yeah, I mean, for the leafing things. out, the delay in leafing, you know, again, I'd be patient. There's a lot of things. We've had this funky spring, so I would, I would be patient with them and maybe later in the summer prune out the dead. We were talking about that kind of looks like sooty mold, which means it's, it's living off the... the uh, <clears throat> like some kind it, of sap, like yeah. exuding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, insect. So whether it's... Uh, yeah, a scale of some sort that's doing that, so. 25 years is kind of old for an aspen. Yeah, they're anyway. doing well, yeah. so. All right. Well, we have a couple of announcements of fun things in the gardening world, and the first of those will be the biggest grower student gardening competition. Started Monday, May 25th. It ends Friday, August 7th. Statewide competition for high school students. Uh, you can register for free, agronomy.unl.edu. That should be a lot of fun. We hope to get a lot of students involved in that. And then, of course, Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer has started. You can watch us on Facebook Thursdays at 8 p.m. Central. And uh, we bring in, of course, experts, and we talk about all the wonderful, fun things that are going on uh, a little deeper in the gardening world. So we have uh, just a couple minutes for a couple of questions. Jody, quickly, the mosquito population in eastern Nebraska, do we expect an explosion based on the rainy weather and would it be instantaneous? Um, it probably wouldn't be instantaneous unless it got really, really, really hot and they increase their life cycle. So dump your standing water or use those mosquito dunks to kill the larvae before they become adults. All right, and Bill, we've had a number of people who say with the mow at three inches, yep. their lawn has become 12 inches, and how do we take off a third if, if the lawn is 12 inches? What do you? One time's okay. Um, you know, generally the grass conditions, so those high heights, we just don't want to be doing that over and over and over. So 
if it's hopefully your mower doesn't bog down, right, and, uh, and is able to do it. But if you're not doing it all the time, sometimes it happens. It's like a sunburn. You try to avoid it. Occasionally it happens, right? So uh, try to avoid it as best as possible, and sometimes you just, you just got to go mow it off. All right, looking at the sunburn on your nose. Yeah, I'm outside. <laughs> and Jeff, really quickly, we have a lot of people who are saying they have little brown tips in their U's. Oh, sure. And like little branches about like this. Right. We, we got several pictures of that. I don't, is that something you're seeing on campus? A little bit. And I, I think some of that funky weather we had at the end may have killed some of that early growth. Um, so I would just go in and just prune those out. All right. Not worry about it. And if they've got new growth, they're probably going to yeah. be okay anyway. Right. All right.